Thank you. We will now start the, the, our scientific session. The opening, the opening lecture, named after uh, Beverly and Dr. Raymond Sackler, who are big donors of uh, the Faculty of Exact Sciences and Tel Aviv University in general, will be given by Professor David Gross. Professor Gross, of course, needs no introduction, still. He has been for several decades and still is a world leader in high energy physics, particle physics, and string theory. He received numerous prestigious prizes, and in particular, he has been awarded together with Frank Wilczek and David Politzer with the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year 2004, actually five years and two days uh, ago, uh, for the discovery of asymptotic freedom in the theory uh, of strong interactions. This fundamental discovery is once again a splendid example of how intuition may mislead us when exploring the nature of physical laws the strong force becomes, in fact, weaker at short distances. The title of uh, Professor Gross' talk will be Phase Factors, Gauge Theories, and Strings. Professor Gross, please. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to help celebrate uh, 50 years of the aronov bohm effect and uh, to discuss all the physics connected with it. Um, I'm going to focus my talk on uh, the meaning of gauge symmetry, the um, reality of the vector potential, the, uh, those are the issues that the aronov bohm effect illuminated in an important way and gave seemingly a definite answer to the question that uh, perturbed many people in the history of uh, electromagnetism and gauge symmetry uh, since its inception 145 years ago. Um, it's interesting to note that the notion of gauge symmetry is uh, the idea which was first appeared in Maxwell's formulation of electrodynamics is 145 years old. And we still, as I will argue, with insights, new perspective from string theory, are developing and understanding its full meaning. It takes an awful long time for deep concepts in physics to sink into our consciousness, to be fully understood. That's why I think that quantum mechanics, which is only 85 years old, is still a young subject. And of course, and the aronov bohm effect is a good example of how the two are now intermeshed. But uh, I think we have for sure at least another 65 years or 60 years of exploring the deeper concepts of quantum mechanics and many and perhaps much more. Our understanding uh, to some extent of these deep concepts in physics takes generations. I hate to paraphrase Keynes in this respect because it's beginning to disturb me. Physics progresses from funeral to funeral. <laughs> so let me start with one of the main messages of the 20th century the recognition that at the center of nature, for whatever reason, perhaps for very good reasons, is symmetry. Symmetry principles were recognized early in the 20th century by Einstein to play the central role in the formulation of the laws of physics. And that lesson strengthened over the decades. Symmetry principles 
play an essential role with respect to the laws of nature. What they do is summarize the regularities of the laws themselves that are independent of the specific dynamics. First realized by Einstein, who, noted, who elevated relativistic invariance, Lorentz invariance, to a principle of symmetry of nature that was more fundamental than Maxwell's equations from which the symmetry emerged. We need such symmetries. We would be lost without them. They provide a structure and a coherence to the laws of nature. In many, in, in, a, in a sense, in the same way that the laws of nature provide a structure and a coherence to the set of events. We make sense out of nature uh, through laws and model, models and principles and eventually laws. But the fact and the existence of such things is wonderful. Otherwise, we couldn't make sense out of nature. But without symmetry principles to guide us and to give a coherence, it's hard to imagine that we would ever discover these laws or understand them. In the 20th century, starting with Einstein and through the development of the standard model and beyond, <clears throat> many of us expect new symmetries that, to exist in nature that will only be discovered when the LHC turns on in a week or two. In the 20th century, we discovered many new kinds of symmetry. And they were new and unobserved because they're often broken by the vacuum state, not manifest in the world around us. But these symmetries are the things that eventually to largely determine the nature of the fundamental forces of nature, like one of the great achievements of the, of, uh, the 20th century, the completion of the standard model of the fundamental forces of nature together with Einstein's discovery that the nature of gravity arose from a deep symmetry under reparameterizations of the coordinates of space and time. We understand today that symmetry, as, Yang, as Professor Yang says, dictates force interaction. It is at the heart of our understanding of the forces of nature. But there are two kinds of symmetry. There are global symmetries, and local symmetries. And they're very different in nature. Global symmetries are regularities of the laws of motion, but are formulated in terms of physical events. The application of the symmetry transformation yields a different physical situation. But observation uh, is invariant under the transformation. That's what the symmetry means. For example, rotational invariance. Consider rotating the laboratory and doing an experiment in the rotated laboratory. That's an experiment. I drop that, measure how long it takes to fall. I rotate the laboratory back. I do the same experiment. I get the same answer. Different laboratory, different physical situation, Say the laws of physics are invariant under the transformation. And that has deep consequences. It leads to conservation of angular momentum. Such global symmetries were the first to be discovered. They are essential. They are the origin of the conservation laws of physics. Without them, we would be lost. If we didn't have translational symmetry under time and spatial translations, we would have to Note in our experimental papers the location and time at which we made the discovery. And every different laboratory would get a different result, and tomorrow you'd get a different result. <clears throat> These glo lo global symmetries, we now believe, are incidental. Our incidental, sometimes accidental, manifestations of deeper principles based on local symmetries, which are much weirder and more mysterious.
Local symmetries, or gauge symmetries, are only formulated in terms of the laws of nature themselves. When you apply the symmetry transformation, you only change our description of the same physical situation. You don't get a new physical situation. In electrodynamics, if I make a gauge transformation on my laboratory, I don't change the laboratory as I do when I rotate it. All I change is the way I describe the laboratory. That doesn't seem like very interesting or powerful. The prime example of this, the first example was Maxwell's equations. Maxwell introduced to describe the electric and magnetic fields, which were physically observable in his time, primarily by Faraday, a potential, a vector and a scalar potential, in terms of which he expressed the electromagnetic fields. The electric and magnetic fields, which in, classic, in Maxwell's theory, gave rise to forces on charged particles. In modern language, we would write this uh, as the electromagnetic field strength, a four tens anti-symmetric four tensor. And we would write Maxwell's <laughs> equations like this, the covariant divergence of the field strength constructed from the vector potential of the electric current. And this kinematical Maxwell equation arises, if you want, from the definition of the, ele of the field strength in terms of the vector potential. One of Einstein's great discoveries was the vector, the understanding of relativistic invariance and index summation, so that Instead of 20 equations that Maxwell had in 1864, we just had two. Well, the field strength and, of course, the equations of motion are totally invariant under gauge transformation, under changes of the vector potential by the gradient of a local field, lambda. The field strength doesn't change. Under a gauge transformation, the vector potential changes, but the field strength and the equations of motion and the force on charged particles doesn't change. The same physical situation. Our description changes. So why did Maxwell introduce this? You don't actually need it, of course. You can just deal with the field equations. And they are physical. You can measure the electric and magnetic fields. Well, Maxwell introduced the vector potential and argued that it was physical for a good reason. He was trying to explain, after all, Faraday's law of induction, which said that if you have magnetic field, a time-dependent magnetic field, Surround it with a wire, current will flow in it. There will be an electromotive force produced by the time derivative of the flux of the magnetic field through the circuit. This was Faraday's law of induction, which Maxwell would write like this. The uh, line integral of the electric field around the circuit is the time derivative of the total flux of the magnetic field through the circuit. But he didn't like this because it, had, it was sort of non-local. The electromotive force, the field, the force pushing charges around the circuit depended on how many of Faraday's lot magnetic lines were passing through this surface as a function of time. How could these lines here affect the charge out there? If, however, you express the electric and magnetic fields in terms of vector potentials, as he did, then the, field, then the flux, which is the total 
flux of B through the surface is given by uh, Stokes' theorem in terms of the line integral of A around the same circuit. So that therefore, the electric field is determined locally by the time dependence of the, of the vector potential on the circuit. And Maxwell said, the electromotive force in a closed conductor is measured by the rate of change of the electrotonic intensity uh, around the circuit. The electrotonic intensity was his word for what we call today the vector potential. So as he says, we've now obtained the means of avoiding the consideration of the quantity of magnetic induction, phi, which passes through a circuit. Instead of this artificial method, we have now the natural one of considering the current with reference to quantities existing in the same space as the current itself. Maxwell really regarded A mu as a physical thing. And the principle that guided him was locality. If you give up the vector potential, then cause the number of magnetic lines passing through the uh, surface, and effect the charge moving around the circuit surrounding that were not in proper contact. You can dispense with a vector potential, but at the price of giving up on locality. Well, following Ma Maxwell, the years following Maxwell electrodynamics was, of course, developed uh, in great and enormous detail, and its, its uh, applications changed our world. And the vector potential was rejected by those pioneers who followed Maxwell, by Hertz and by Heaviside and by Lawrence and so on. They all regarded it as a mere mathematical tool which you can introduce if you want to. And maybe Maxwell's reasons were reasonable, but it's not necessary. It has no meaning in of it itself. You don't need it to formulate Maxwell's equations. You don't need it to derive the consequences of electromagnetism. And they forgot and they thought gauge invariance was simply, gauge symmetry was simply the way of expressing the fact that you don't need it. It only really reemerged on the scene of physics with quantum mechanics. For after all, in quantum mechanics, it's not just enough to have the equations of motion. In fact, we rarely write down the equations of motion. We write down a Hamiltonian and derive the Schrodinger equation. Or in modern quantum mechanics, we write down a path integral in terms of a Lagrangian. We don't write down the Newton's second law. We can derive it. It's a classical approximation. Don't force is not primary. The Hamiltonian is primary. The Lagrangian is primary. And we need the vector potential to construct the canonical formalism, the canonical momentum. When in the presence of an electromagnetic field, we require the vector potential to construct the canonical momentum. The Hamiltonian cannot be written in a local form without the, the vector potential, nor can the Lagrangian. <laughs> Still, it's a mathematical artifact. An interesting turn came when another gauge theory was discovered, a very important gauge theory, the theory of general relativity. When Einstein realized that the equivalence principle implied that our description of space-time itself is subject to an enormous gauge invariance in which we're allowed 
to make local reparameterizations of the coordinates of space-time themselves, and that the laws of physics, the observables of physics, should not be in changed. That is an enormous gate symmetry. Not that it was really understood as such in modern terms at the time, but it was the basis for Einstein's theory of general relativity. And there, the metric of space-time, in a sense, is like the gauge field, which transforms under reparameterizations of the coordinates and changes. And nobody could say that the metric wasn't physical and real. Although gravity, general relativity, in many respects, is still mysterious. After all, it's only a hundred and, uh, let's see, a hundred and, how old is it? Um, is that not even a hundred? It's 90 years old. Uh, maybe a little more, 94. Anyway, it's less than 100 years old. That's nothing. The young field. And there you have a problem. You can't do like you did with Maxwell's equations and simply get rid of the coordinates. Or you, maybe you can. We'll come to that later. But it's not easy to imagine describing anything without the coordinates of space and time. And there aren't very many observables. Unlike in Maxwell's theory, where the position and velocity of a charged particle, all of those were observable. What's observable and independent of a reparameterization of the coordinates in general relativity? Very few things. In any case, inspired by this geometrization of gravity, Weil introduced a local gauge symmetry, introduced the name because he mistakenly wanted to derive geometrically electromagnetism by introducing a change and invariance under local scale transformations of space and time. That's why it was called gauge. Bad name. But stuck with us like many other bad names. And it was really London who explained that as a complex phase symmetry of the wave function of charged particles. And so the gauge symmetry of Maxwell was, play, was revived with quantum mechanics, and complex wave functions, and was realized to be a U1 gauge phase factor under a U1 gauge transformation. And then, of course, in the middle of the century, in 1954, Yang and Mills extended this notion of a comp this complex phase to a, a complex matrix, to a unitary matrix, and extended the notion of gauge symmetry from the abelian gauge symmetry of electrodynamics to non-abelian groups. And in that case, of course, in the case of Yang and Mills' formulation of, electro de, of, of Yang Mills' theory, non-abelian gauge theory, you can't do without the vector potential. You can't even write down the equations, Maxwell's equations, Yang Mills' equations, without introducing the vector potential, since the, now the vector potential is a matrix, the generator in the Lie algebra of the gauge group, as is the field strength, and the covariant derivative gives you a gauge invariant set of equations of motion involves the vector potential. So even if you say the field strength is observable, which it really isn't, because it too is charged, a charged field and gauge dependent, then uh, a mu appears in the equations of motion. You don't have the option that you did after Maxwell of forgetting about the vector potential. And then, of course, even before that in the 30s, 
Dirac considered what, how magnetic monopoles appear in quantum mechanics. And proved that if magnetic monopoles exist, charge is quantized. Remarkable um, observation, which is at the center, its follow-up is at the center of much of our study today of quantum field theories. What he did was observe that if you put a monopole into electrodynamics, it's rather singular. There's a string attached to it. And that, however, if the monopole and the charge, the basic charges in nature, satisfy a certain quantization condition, then this string is, has no observable effect. You realize that if you go around this string, the wave function is multiplied by a phase, which is determined by the charge of the monopole and the electric charge going around this circuit. And in order for the string to have no observable effect, this phase should be a multiple of 2 pi. I might have a factors of two wrong. Consequently, the product of the electric charge and the magnetic charge, or all possible electric charges or magnetic charges, should be in the appropriate fundamental units and integer. And if there exists in the world one magnetic monopole, then all electric charges would be quantized as they appear to be. Well, those of you, of course, this audience made up of Arno Bohm practitioners will recognize this as Dirac say, saying, although he didn't talk about the Arno Bohm effect, what he was essentially demanding was that there be no Arno Bohm effect in order to get uh, an integer. But he never discussed what would happen in other situations where there is an effect, of course. And the Aaron of Bohm effect really uh, made it very beautifully conclusive that the vector potential is real. <coughs> For, as they observed and discussed in great detail, if you pass electrons as like around that fake magnetic string, but if you pass them around a region of space in which there is a magnetic field, even though outside that region where the electrons are confined, all fields vanish, there is an observed interference or a shift in the interference pattern on a screen. Or there should be, they predict that there would be. And given uh, with a phase shift, which depends on the total flux of the magnetic field, but this comes in a region where there is no field. There is just a vector potential. This was a very conclusive and experimentally verifiable demonstration of all the physics that I've been discussing till now. You can express this in other ways if you want to give up on the vector potential. But then you have to as Maxwell did in the, with time-dependent fields, make some in, have some non-locality non in your description of nature. If you want a local description, the vector potential is real, and the phase, this phase factor is measurable and was measured. Well, these gauge theories by now we recognize have a real vector potential, of course, or a vector potential, which certainly as far as these phase factors goes, is measurable and real, are the basis of our theory of all the forces of nature. Gravity is a gauge theory of the reparameterization of the coordinates of space-time. The forces that act within the atom Electromagnetism and within the nucleus, the weak and strong forces are all consequences of local gauge symmetries. 
In fact, you don't have much choice. Once you demand a symmetry, this invariance principle, there aren't many ways of realizing it. They're pretty unique. And the way we treat these theories is now heavily dependent upon taking as the basic dynamical degrees of freedom the gauge vector potential degrees of freedom, or actually these phase factors. Consider, for example, QCD, theory of the strong interactions. Very difficult theory, very beautiful theory, almost no parameters. In some sense, no parameters, just a scale. If you assume, take light quarks to be very massless, which they almost are, and heavy quarks to be infinitely massive, which they almost are, theory with no parameters, you should be able to calculate all the properties of hadrons and nuclei. That's a tough problem. So people put that theory on a lattice. And putting a theory on a lattice in a well-defined way, where you have a finite number of points and a finite number of degrees of freedom, makes you really confident that you have a well-defined thing. And then QCD is defined some kind of limit, and the lattice spacing A is taken to zero. This can be done very precisely and illuminates the real essence of a theory. If you can really put it on a computer, then you understand it. And when you do that, you discover that the basic variables don't live at points, but they actually live on links. They're non-local. There are these little integrals of the gauge field of the vector potential from one point to the neighboring point. The basic variables are non-local links, phase factors. They're not by themselves in gauge invariant. You can make a rotation uh, in, uh, in, well, in the case of strong interactions, SU3 at this end and a different rotation at this end. And the Observables actually live on these plaquettes. When you go around, take the trace of those four matrices, you get an observable from which you can sort of extract this phase factor and in the limit of small gauge field, the field strengths. But the field strengths are derived quantities. They're not, they never appear in the formulation of the theory. They're just approximations to one class of observables. Basic observables are these little line integrals of the gauge vector potential. And the basic observables are these uh, phase factors that R and Ove and Bohm show contain physical information. This lattice QCD with big lattices of 30 times 30 times 30 times 30 points in space and time have been used now in large, massive computers and lots of people working very hard to calculate the mass spectrum of hadrons, of nucleons. Essentially in terms of no numbers, but if you want to you know, get the real world, you have to put in a scale for QCD and put in the masses of the light quarks, three numbers. But you get the rest. And by now, the, the uh, success in reproducing the spectrum is spectacular. It's at approaching the level of 1%. First principle calculation of the masses of the nucleon, this famous uh, Omega minus of SU3 of flavor, so on. Okay, so that's the standard model understanding of gauge invariance and of the vector potential. It is the essential degree of freedom. But is this symmetry, gauge symmetry, really a symmetry? Eugene Wigner said who was a great student of symmetry principles and proponent of symmetry in quantum mechanics, wrote that gauge invariance is, of course, an artificial symmetry. 
It's similar to that which we could obtain by introducing in our equations the location of a ghost. The equations must be invariant with respect to the coordinates of that ghost. One does not see, in fact, what good the introduction of the coordinate of the ghost does. Well, that's... Wigner, of course, was a deep thinker, and he was both wrong and right at the same time. In the naive sense, the vector potential has no meaning, he was wrong. But in a deeper sense, the gauge symmetry expresses somehow a kind of redundancy of our description of nature. And that the symmetry simply tells us that we're describing it in a redundant way and can make gauge transformation that reduce that redundancy is true. So, so what, do we really understand this? Well, I, I don't think so. It'll take another hundred years or more. But we've learned something recently. And I'm going to give you a few lessons from string theory. Which I'm sure most of you don't know and suspect. String theory, however, is not different than gauge theory, as we've learned in the last decade. It's the same thing. It's a different side. And that's why it illuminates this issue. In fact, in string theory, as I'll show you, the, the gauge degrees of freedom could be regarded as dynamical modes of things, we, of brains, of extended objects, which are, in effect, collective excitations of gravitational degrees of freedom. And therefore, the coordinates of these gauge degrees of freedom that live in this fiber bundle, and I haven't introduced the whole beautiful mathematics of fiber bundle. Hopefully, some one will. Are emergent. And to some extent, the symmetry that moves them around is because they're redundant descriptions of other degrees of freedom. But equivalently, space itself can be regarded as an emergent description of the dynamics of gauge fields, a description which is automatically then invariant under local changes of the coordinates, which really weren't there at all. So if you introduce the ghosts, or they emerge dynamically, then you can reparametrize them at will. And this is all related to this incredible duality, which was there and the motivation for string theory in its beginning, and whose full extent is, has been revealed over the last 40 years and continues. In the beginning, it was the duality of scattering amplitudes, where here two strings come in, this is an open string coming in, and described by this disk, so-called disk amplitude, in which the string propagates and joins with another string and then emerges. So this is two open strings scattering. And this diagram can be viewed in as these strings scattering or these strings scattering in the S channel or in the T channel. And if you pull it out in the S channel, you get uh, looks like a fattened version of this kind of Feynman diagram, whereas if you pull it out in the T channel, it looks like this version of a, of a Feynman diagram. And both of these are described by the one string amplitude. Well, that was the duality that gave rise to string theory. But it is actually responsible for a weirder duality, so-called UV infrared duality, which relates open strings, which will turn out to be gauge particles, to closed strings, which will turn out to be gravity. And this was first observed in considering a loop correction, so-called annulus correction, to, two to the scattering amplitudes of two strings. So in this case, you have two strings coming in here, 
and then merging into this annulus and then coming out here. And this diagram can be viewed, it's a radiative correction, a loop correction to scattering of open strings, can be viewed as an open string going around a loop, like a Feynman diagram. Or it can be viewed as a closed string propagating from this circle to this circle. To make that clearer, let's stretch, pull this circle here out so that the, this annulus with the strings attached, these open strings attached, looks like a cylinder with the strings attached here, that's this circle, or here, that's in this circle. And now you see that this diagram describes an open string going around the cylinder, or a closed string propagating up the cylinder. Both are valid descriptions. Turns out that one is good in the ultraviolet, one is good in the infrared. And the ultraviolet behavior of the open string propagating around gives rise to infrared singularities of the closed string propagation. The closed string description in the ultraviolet describes the open string description in the infrared and vice versa. And in particular, the very high growth of the number of string states with increasing mass gives rise to singularities in the closed string channel, which it turns out are gravitons spin to massless particles. That's how, in string theory, gravity was so-called discovered. Starting with open strings, you produced gravity as a dynamical effect because of this weird duality. So open strings contain gravity, and gravity emerges from the dynamics of open strings. And vice versa, as was discovered much later, by Bolchinsky, D brains, even which exist even in theories with ha which have no open strings, are places where open strings can end. And a D brain can be thought of as a soliton of the closed string theory. So in string theory, if you start with a closed string theory, you think you're describing only objects with no ends, with no labels, gravity alone, just the dynamics of space and time, and yet there can be solitons of those gravitational degrees of freedom on which open strings can end, so that such theories can contain, if deep brains are around, open strings, these brains can fluctuate and curve, they can be, be multiple dimension, which is why they're called brains and not membranes. And they are, of course, dynamical objects. They source gravitational fields. They have a mass. But their dynamics is governed by open strings. And open strings at low energies must contain a gauge field. It's easy to argue that by hand-waving. I don't know of a general argument except the one that the excited state of a string, which looks like a little vector, has no transverse modes of oscillation because it has no longitudinal modes of oscillation, only transfer mode, transverse modes, because the longitudinal mode of oscillation of a string is just a reparameterization of the coordinates of the string. <laughs> And the string theory itself is constructed, or as all theories are, on assuming that we can reparameterize its coordinates without changing the physics. So an open string only has transverse degrees of freedom, and that we know from general principles of Lorentz invariance must be described by a gauge particle, massless gauge particle like the photon or the gluon. So starting with closed string theories, brains produce open strings and gauge fields.
If you have a stack of brains, a whole bunch of brains, which you stack up on top of each other, say n of them, then an open string can end on, on the brain uh, whose label is i or j. So it has two labels associated with it, i and j. And you won't be surprised that the low energy modes of that string is a gauge field with indices i, j, described by, in the simplest case, by an sun gauge theory, just like we use in the standard model. So start with gravity, no gauge degrees of freedom, no charges, solitons, produce them, and the symmetry is just because there was no ever any local meaning to these particular labeling that we put in. And conversely, you start with the brains, start with a whole lot of brains, describable by a SUN gauge theory. Take the theory to be supersymmetric, because otherwise you can't do very much. Put enough of them in, they'll, they have mass. They change the geometry. They curve it. And if you concentrate near the horizon of the black brain that's produced, you discover that the gauge theory decouples near this horizon, which has a geometry of ADS5 cross S5. And you can, as Maldacena conjectured, establish an equivalence between the four-dimensional n equals four supersymmetric gauge theory a close cousin of the standard model, and string theory, a particular version of constructing string theory solutions in an anti disitter background. So starting with the gauge particles, you construct a new dimension of space and a dynamical space-time with gravity. And its coordinates, of course, are invariant under reparameterizations. They weren't there to begin with. Those ghosts were created by the dynamics, and their reparameterizations obviously don't change physics. This is the famous ADS-CFT duality, which has impacted string theory in such a big way in the last decade, and from which we've learned so much, because we can use it to learn about gravity from gauge theories and about gauge theory from gravity. Both ways are very informative. Four-dimensional gauge theory, or actually, candidate for a quantum critical point. Condensed matter physicists now use this to learn about conformally invariant four-dimensional theories. Gauge theories might provide an example of such. You geometrize the renormalization group or the scale of objects in terms of a new dimension. And because of the dynamics I explained previously, you get five-dimensional, actually ten-dimensional. There's a little compact sphere or space in anti disitter space. The fifth dimension that emerges is related in the four-dimensional theory to the scale scaling of objects in four dimensions. This is a gem geometrization of, renorm of the renormalization group. Small objects in the ultraviolet, objects in the ultraviolet or small objects in the gauge theory are represented by objects in anti de Sitter space that are close to its Minkowski boundary. <coughs> Large objects are far into the bulk. You move out in five dimensions. In the gauge theory, you scale up the size of them. You can put matter into this, like quarks. And they are indeed bound by strings. So you'd expect they would be confined. But this theory, the simplest example, is conformally invariant. Scale invariant, so the potential between two quarks must go like 1 over r. And it does because the string wanders out into this fifth dimension, which is warped by general relativity, by the energy of the, these brains, so that the energy out here is much less 
than it would be if the string was here. The string wanders out such that you get Coulomb's law. If, however, the dynamics cuts off this space, or you do it by hand, you break, you get confinement. You get the actual situation where quarks are coupled or are um, bound by a string with finite tension cut off someplace here. And this actually provides a real model for QCD. And uh, the hope is eventually an enormous progress has been made on using this to explore the properties of gauge theories, of heavy ion collisions, the quark gluon plasma, and now even of quantum critical points in condensed matter physics, superconductivity. The hope is we can break the supersymmetry, and in the case of QCD, really calculate the properties of what you observe when you calculate in a meson the flux tube connecting two quarks, a fat QCD string. But let me come back to our uh, question I was asking. Are these gauge degrees of freedom real or imaginary? Are gauge degrees of freedom emergent from modes of dynamical space-time? Or is space-time emergent from gauge degrees of freedom? Or both? The answer is, I have no idea. And it's bound to be more interesting and more paradoxical. Both pictures are equally valid, it seems. If I had a bet, I would say both pictures are emergent descriptions of something else, which perhaps is less redundant than all of these descriptions, both of space and time and of gauge degrees of freedom. So that I, but I can't answer what that ultimate description is. However, in our quest to find out, we could do no better than follow Yakir's example in exploring deeply the quantum paradoxes of space and time and force. Thank you. The naive questions are the worst. Yes. <laughs> so we understand what is the naive question. Thanks. Uh, so I, I, you explained why uh, or, or the, this mapping between uh, four dimension uh, and five dimensions. Either a simple way of understanding why uh, six more dimensions are needed. Then uh, you mentioned this uh, uh, compact five. Uh, or, or five more. Uh, you mentioned this compact. Uh, Sphere. Why can't we do without it? Um, you actually, it too uh, emerges. By the way, a compact to, to, for a compact domain uh, space to emerge is not so complicated. Think about a circle. If you have a theory on a circle and you decompose into Fourier modes, it just means you have a whole mass spectrum. If you ignore the excited states, you don't see the circle. So what happens um, is that there are degrees of freedom in this super in this field theory which fill out the modes, the, the circle, this uh, five-dimensional sphere, or in other cases, a more complicated internal space. Uh, I don't, you know, there are many answers why 10 dimensions in string theory. They're sort of technical. There's no hand-waving argument. Uh, I could explain it to you quite simply in some ways, but it is sort of built into string theory. It's one, you know, in the use of string theory, which, by the way, isn't a theory. 
which is a framework. In the use of string framework to construct unified theories of all the forces and explain the real world, we have a little problem of understanding how the extra six dimensions really compactify. And, um, but they're sort of built into the consistency of string theory. Although that, you know, as I said, if the dimensions are compact, whether you want to say you have uh, five extra dimensions or a lot of degrees of freedom in a, you know, with equal spacing, it's up to you. It's sort of two descriptions of the same thing. Excuse me? May I have a question? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> As an outsider, I keep reading that there are something like, uh, I don't know, 10 to the 100 or something solutions to string theory. What, what Can you tell us anything about that? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you're all like that. <laughs> <laughs> there are, and, you know, there, there are lots of bad solutions in the sense that they're all sick of the order of 10 to the something big uh, of non-supersymmetric so-called vacua, which is, they're not actually stationary, and they all have singularities in their past, and they all might be problematic for that reason. But there are also an infinite number of Supersymmetric solutions, which are pretty boring universes where nothing happens. And uh, we don't know what. My view is we're not dealing with a theory. Quantum field theory has an infinite number of solutions or infinite number of theories, parameters you can adjust. String theory has no parameters but an infinite number of ways of constructing quantum states. But we don't have equations. You know, string theory shouldn't be called a theory. The standard model shouldn't be called a model. The standard model is a theory. You've got a few parameters, you go out and calculate. String theory is not a theory because we don't have the equations. We don't know what the Hamiltonian, the Lagrangian, the principle. We don't know what the rules are <laughs> for discussing quantum cosmologies, which is what we have to discuss. So we have a way of constructing solutions, and there are lots of ways, enormous number or infinite number of constructing solutions. Uh, some people search uh, among those ways of constructing somewhat good <coughs> solutions, not worrying about the Big Bang, ones that might look like the real world, and that's very worthy. You should always do that. I think we're missing something to make string framework, a method of constructing solutions, into a theory. I don't know what it is. It has something to do with the puzzles I discussed, something to do with cosmology. It's a long story, but when we figure it out, it will illuminate both, I am sure, both our understanding of symmetries, local symmetries, and quantum mechanics. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm getting the signal that actually we are... One, one very uh, quick question, Professor Gross. On the Faraday's law, and the simple law that you said that the introduction of the vector potential actually uh, deals with locality issues. This is an instantaneous relation that happens at one particular instant. How does this take into account retardation effects? The fact that at the same time... Well, I, I was just quoting... Ma not reached, yeah. uh, the so the question was about retardation effects. Well, we all understand it now. When Maxwell wrote that paragraph, you know, he um, was, a, I think, a bit confused. If I, I've read Max, I've read some of this history. It's very interesting. Uh, carefully, uh, Maxwell, you know, when Maxwell um, solved the wave equation, velocity, predicted light, um, if you want, uh, he. Um, he used the vector potential in, in, in a weird gauge, a gauge we don't particularly like today. And he, I don't think he really understood retarded potentials. And, uh, and there's no paradox there. Um, of course, the effects are propagated with the speed of light. 
and and you the case that Maxwell was discussing didn't convince the people who came after him uh, because you know, he was discussing a case where the magnetic field is varying and there is an electric field pushing the electron around in the circuit. So this wasn't a case where you really need the vector potential. It's just that Maxwell really liked to have E described locally by the, the, by the vector potential. And that's why he, you know, he, he argued that this vector potential which he introduced simplifies things was real. Or the electromotive, what do you call it? Electrotonic. <laughs> and he actually uh, gave a, uh, a way of physically determining the vector potential. He said the vector potential is the instantaneous momentum multiplied by E. The instantaneous momentum that a charged particle would have at a point if you suddenly remove the field. So he, had, you know, he knew that that it was part of the canonical momentum. Um, but, you know, you can do away with it. And, and it's really only in quantum mechanics that, it, you know, as uh, Arnold Bohm and others showed, plays this essential role. And it's only in non-abelian gauge theories where it really plays an essential role. It can't, can't be discarded at all. But it's just a redundancy of this way of describing physics. So what is real? But so is space and time. Thank you. Okay, uh, coffee is waiting, so let's thank Professor Gross again.